Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the June 4th regular meeting of the Zion City Council. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Preston? Here. Commissioner Holmes? Here. Commissioner McDowell? Here. Commissioner Fisher? Here. 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 Item number three is a Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Bremner, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Please join me in pledging allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag. Leading us in prayer this evening will be Oscar Parham from Home Away From Home. Parham, how are you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you too. Good to see everybody. How y'all doing? Doing great. Item number four, uh, agenda changes. Are there any agenda changes by any of the commissioners? If not, is there a motion to accept the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. All right, we have a first and a second. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Bryson? Aye. Commissioner Holmes? Aye. Commissioner Dell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Aye. Motion carries five to zip. Now we have citizens' comments. Item number five, uh, Julie Bucci, uh, would you approach? And just for some of you that have not attended the uh, council meetings in the past, there is a, a three-minute limit on citizens' comments. So we ask you to be uh, succinct with your comments. My name is Julia Bucci, I live at 3010 Edina Boulevard, and my family was affected by the sewage backup along with many other friends and neighbors. We lost items that can't be replaced and appliances that are costly to replace. I do have pictures of a list of items lost if anyone is interested. My main concern is safety and cleaning and sterilization. What is the city of Zion doing to prevent another backup? And is there anything that can be done to get help to those affected? Right. Thank you. We, we typically don't uh, answer any co uh, questions at citizens' comment, but during departmental commentary, uh, someone will address uh, your issues. Thank you. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. Mary Lou Hildebrandt. Peter? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the, uh, the 1903 Kenosha uh, Road Project. I want to thank the commissioners for 
giving us the opportunity uh, to uh, respond to all the comments that were made um, from the, uh, both the or issues that were raised by both the neighbors, by commission members. Uh, we did uh, give, a, give you a written response, which I hope addressed all your concerns adequately. Uh, if uh, there are any more additional issues or questions that need to be addressed uh, at the time that you consider uh, the, uh, the proposal, we would uh, request uh, the opportunity to respond. All right, thank you. Thank you. Item number six is consent agenda. Approval of minutes of the regular meeting held on May 21st, 2024 at 7 p.m. Approval but not release of closed session minutes on the meeting held on May 21st, 2024 at 7.46 p.m. The motion to approve the minutes. Uh, motion by Holmes. Second. Second by McDowell. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Ferguson. Aye. Commissioner Holmes? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Mary Hilton? Abstain. Bills, vouchers 146099 through 146120 and Huntington National Bank, total $587,546.87. Is there a motion to approve the bills? I'll move to approve the bills. Second. Motion by Fisher, second by McDowell. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Carson? Aye. Commissioner Holmes? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Mary Kelly? Aye. Motion carries. Five zip. Item number seven, consider passing resolution as follows. A, authorizing the execution of Illinois Public Water Supply Loan Program application documents per Director Robert. Thank you, sir. The Water Department is currently conducting an inventory of the lead and galvanized water service lines, supply lines throughout the city. We anticipate completion of this inventory by October 2024. Staff has been investigating different funding opportunities to accomplish the required replacement of these service lines. One funding opportunity is for the city to apply for an IEPA lead line lead service line replacement loan program. This is a low interest loan with a possible up to 80% forgiveness. However, if approved, the city is responsible for 100% of the service line replacement costs. These costs are estimated for a replacement as John John? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, estimated cost of replacement is $10,000 $15,000 per service line. Within the requested loan amount is the cost of design and construction engineering. Requested loan amount is $5,278,000 with a 30-year term. The applica application requires approval of an ordinance to incur debt, the debt amount, and a resolution from Administrator Nable, authority to sign the application in the form of the document. Staff requests and recommend approval to take all reasonable steps to submit the loan application. Funding for repayment of the loan would be an item within the fiscal, future fiscal year water budgets. Um, I would like to point out that's a big number, 5278000 but that's driven off of estimated right now of maybe around 400 lead lines inventory. We are currently around 75% through the city, and we've only found maybe 30, 35 so far. So I think that number will come down by the time we put this application in. However, I wanted to make sure we were covered, not had to go back in case we hit a heavy area. Okay. Is there a motion to authorize the execution of the Illinois Public Water Supply Loan Program application? Make the motion. Motion by Holmes. Second. Second by Fisher. Uh, any questions or comments from the commissioners? Um, just one for me. What, what's the criteria for the forgiveness of that loan? It's all based on your uh, the census low income census, okay. um, which we are pretty heavy on. So 
I did not include that in with this loan packet. There's another seven pages that we, we would turn in with that, showing the census tracts in the, in the low income areas and in the moderate income areas throughout the city. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, although this may be a question for uh, Administrator Nabel. Um, worst case, if the 80% uh, is not abated, then uh, what would be our plan to pay for this? So, oh, oh, oh. you going to answer? <laughs> you're, you're more than welcome to, but <laughs> All right. it's well, a discussion with both of us. So. <laughs> Director Nabel and I have been talking about this. So the repayment on this loan for the 30 year period, if, if we had no forgiveness, we were looking at um, a height of maybe two to 300,000 that would be taken directly out of the um, infrastructure portion of the line item of the water fund. Okay. So that would decrease. Typically, we run about a million dollar project every year for replacement. That would obviously subtract that by 300,000. Gotcha. So it would lessen our amount that we could put in the ground and deploy. Okay. Um, and was there any range on low interest? Not, not, not that really. I could tell. It was okay. all based off of your census and your application going in. Okay. Um, I think previous years I saw around 1 to 2%. Okay. Great. Thank so you. We are talking about the state. <laughs> Any other questions from the commissioners? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Carson? Aye. Commissioner Holmes? Aye. Commissioner Sal? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 5 zip. Item number 8 considered passing ordinances as follows 8A authorizing the city of Zion in Lake County, Illinois to borrow friend from the public water supply loan program per Director Roberts. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is basically covered underneath my previous uh, memo. This is the other section of it that we would need to uh, approval of an ordinance to incur this amount of debt. All right. Is there a motion to approve uh, authorizing the city of Zion to borrow funds from the public water supply loan program? So moved. Second. Motion by Holmes and second by Fisher. Any questions or comments? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Harrison? Aye. Commissioner Holmes? Aye. Commissioner Dow? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Mayor King? Aye. Motion carries five to zip. Item number 8C, authorizing and improving services, peer support and mental health services for members of the Zion Police Department from We Never Walk Alone per Chief Barton. Thank you. I'm just reversing them. 8B, excuse me, authorizing and improving the purchase of products and services from Flock Lot Group Inc. per Chief Barton. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you. The City of Zion is currently partnered with Flock Industries to use technology to abate crime and criminal activity. While already using LPR technology, Flock Industries offer a free trial year of their innovative gunshot detection software. We've used this technology over the last year. During this time, we've been alerted to numerous shooting scenes prior to a citizen call. This has improved our response time and significant improved our response time significantly to these sorts of calls. Based on the effective nature of these combined technologies through Flock Industries, they respectfully request a continued partnership. I've included a three-year agreement to your, for your review. This agreement offers a $10,000 cost reduction per year and locks the price until this time of 2027. All right, is there a, a motion to authorize and approve the purchase of products and services from Flock Group? So moved. Motion by McDowell. Second. Second by Holmes. Uh, questions or comments? Yes, I have a question, Chief. Um, you say numerous. How many? I am looking it up. I knew this was coming. So yep. <laughs> you need to be ready for it. While you're looking at information up, can you uh, tell our audience here, some of our residents, why the flock products have been so good in helping us to reduce crime here in the city and how they operate? So the, the, the flock products have worked both with the ALPR and the gunshot detection system. They work in concert together. Now, we have uh, a, a faster response.
response time because the notifications come right to the squad car computer that the officer sees, that the sergeants see them in, on their desktops as well. So if we have a stolen car, or if we have gunshots that are heard, we don't have to wait for a caller to get up, to get to their phone, or to maybe not even recognize what it is. We get the information direct from the software, through the software, right to the computers. And we get that response about um, 20 seconds is, 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 a, is an average time we're seeing. Sometimes it's faster, not usually slow. And in terms of working with other community, how has this helped us solve some crimes here in the area? So we work tightly with other neighboring communities because we can identify an offending vehicle in a crime. Maybe it's, it's a retail theft or maybe it's a violent crime in another town. We can put an auto alert so when that vehicle or uh, if there's something associated with that vehicle that we need to know, be notified right away if it comes into town, a great example of this is uh, Vernon Hills just used this information and there was a, uh, a press release public notice put out the other day of a crime, three, in fact, three crime gangs, uh, retail theft gangs that were working, that were wanted across the United States in 10 different states, they weren't in 10 different states, and it impacted a number of communities um, to the tune of approximately $500,000 of theft just from Vernon Hills. Uh, over the last, or I'm sorry, just in the state of Illinois, but targeting where the most specifically, where we were able to get notified of that vehicle arriving to the suspected area where the crime is going to be committed, and officers were able to respond. And in doing so, they also took down with, uh, these three crime gangs. They liberated a number of people that were promised work and were contained in the back of the new vehicle for unknown purposes, but Venezuelan individuals that were uh, migrants. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a prime example of how, it, how fast it works on the way to New York. So I can answer the gunshot question. Um, everyone. So, every, every gunshot. Yeah, so we, over the last year, um, we've been able to categorize 581 total alerts. I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Um, of those 581, 201 of those <coughs> were identified as single gunshot alerts. There were additional 294 fireworks alerts. Uh, of those 581 initial calls, total of uh, multiple gunshot alerts were 86. So of those calls, we got instant notification and officers were responding within seconds rather than minutes, potentially, of, of a person having a call. Okay. We had identified several specific calls where nobody called. There was no callers um, on, on these incidents. And we, in fact, made multiple arrests and guns were recovered in a shooting um, in a shooting. <coughs> so. All right. Thank you. Chief, can you talk about the existing coverage? And would we be looking to expand that? or? Is the coverage chosen correct? Using heat mapping, we've, we've identified the, the coverage area to continue to be the same area. We have an area uh, east of Lewis and west of Galilee, uh, north and south to 33rd and 21st Street. That's very good, I guess. Okay. I don't want to expand. I, I, I don't think we need to expand at this point. This is, this is sufficient. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? for Chief Barton. All right, uh, we had a first and a second. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Ferguson? Aye. Commissioner Holmes? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Mayor King? Aye, motion carries five to zip. Now on the item C, authorizing and improving services, peer support and mental health services for members of the Zion Police Department from We Never Walk Alone for Chief Barton. Yeah, thank you, Honorable Mayor McKinney, Commissioners. As part of our continued efforts to support our Zion police officers through the myriad of difficult calls that they see, we have put together a comprehensive plan to address the overall health and well-being of each officer. We have implemented, implemented to date updating training, instruction, as well as providing modern physical fitness centers. The last component that we want to fulfill is the mental health piece. I have instructed staff to research and seek out opportunities to address the mental health and support needs. The We Never Walk Alone Foundation was set up to help first responders cope and manage the stressors of this job. We Never Walk Alone is a private agency that provides national 
our nationwide peer support and mental health network. The agency provides, uh, I'll list a few things here, 24 seven access to nearly 400 training peer supporters, access to nearly 125 mental health professionals, online self-assessment tests to help officers go in the right direction for mental health needs, a centralized database of uh, external resources for those who do not wish to speak with any peers, provides training to four of our officers as we would continue to add to the pool of peer supporters for this service. The service allows officers to speak with other officers who do not work for the Zion Police Department and gives them a starting point to access any mental health resources so there's anonymity and provides specialized veterans resources. The required contributions, costs, and commitments are as follows. We would have to train four to five officers through this, their, we never walk alone in the process. We would need to agree to a three-year term commitment. Um, it is, it, the cost to the city is at $30 per officer per year. And then um, there's a civilian option as well. The total cost for, for three years would be $5,580 or $1,860 annually. I respectfully request approval of this agreement as provided for the three year term of $1,860. All right. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion by McDowell. Second. Second by Frierson. Questions or comments? Uh, my comment I just think, uh, given that I've been able to be out in the field with some of our police officers and since COVID, uh, we have seen the climate, not only our climate change, but the environmental change that we've seen of how residents uh, treat people in authority and our police officers. And I've said this when I've been out on calls with them a couple of times, I just don't know how they do it other than terrific training and being able to keep their composure with things that are said to them and done to them during when they're enforcing laws of our community. So I, I think this mental health services for our, our police department and I think for anyone is crucial, especially after COVID. And I think we're still seeing that in our school systems and we're still seeing it with adults as well. Uh, Madam Clerk, we have a first and a second. Any more comments? Uh, Call the roll, please. Commissioner Bryson? Aye. Commissioner Holmes? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Aye. Motion carries five to zip. Item number 8D regarding surplus property in the police department per Chief Bart. Yeah, thank you, Honorable Mayor. McKinney and Commissioners, staff have completed some housekeeping and our organization tasks within the police department. We've identified several items of surplus equipment, mainly old, broken, or non serviceable items. The following items have been collected and categorized as surplus. Two printers, seven computer monitors, ten computer hard drives that would be removed and destroyed. Old keyboards, there are several mice and chargers. There's additional several, several old hard drives and then assortment of boards and tables. I respectfully request that all items be declared surplus equipment and destroyed or disposed of. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion by Commissioner McDowell. Second. Second by Commissioner Holmes. Uh, questions or comments? Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Carson? Aye. Commissioner Holmes? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? Aye. Commissioner Aye. Motion carries five to zip. Item number nine, discussion, authorization, and approval. Considering 9A is considered zoning docket 24Z8, an ordinance requesting a zoning change from light manufacturing to G1 General Industrial at the property located at 1903 Kenosha Road per Director Ianton. Thank you, Honorable Commissioners. Downfield LLC is seeking a zoning change from light manufacturing to General Industrial at the property located at 
tenants, both for self storage and truck spaces, will have 24 7 self access. Self storage access will be located approximately 250 feet into the development, and the one for the truck parking access will be located approximately 400 feet into the development. Felt the concerns regarding trucks idling overnight, noise pollution, and having smell of engine exhaust. The petitioner has committed to installing block heaters, which will eliminate the need for heating engines running in the cold weather. The project is proposed in two phases. First, consisting of access improvements, stormwater management facilities, and landscape improvements along the North Road, begin later this summer or early this fall. Landscape improvements will also be consist of the maintenance and repair building and 50 truck parking spaces. The second phase will consist of self storage units along the remaining truck parking space will begin sometime in 2026. The North Road is under the jurisdiction of the Lake County Division of Transportation. This access design will be will need full compliance of the Lake County DOT ordinances and the local requirements that will determined by a traffic study, which will be part of the final engineering practice. If the council considers the request, staff is recommending we make this requirement along with any additional conditions the council may have part of the special unit The April 4th, 2024 plan is only commission to recommend to deny the request for the vote for the Okay. Uh, do we have a motion to deny the request? Um, I'll make a motion to uphold the decision from the recommending body All right. to deny. We have a, a motion by Frierson. Second. Second, Second by McDowell. Uh, questions or comments? Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Frierson? Aye. Commissioner Holmes? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? No. Mayor King? Uh, no. Motion carries. Right, motion carries to deny. To deny. Right, this, 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 right. Thank, well, thank you. Right. Yeah. I meant to say aye. You, you, you can say that. Yeah. I mean, actually, uh, Madam Clerk, I meant to say aye. Oh. So four to one. Yeah. Item uh, 9B considers zoning docket 24Z.9, an ordinance requesting a special use permit to operate a truck service repair lease parking facility at the property located at 1903 Kenosha Road, per Director Ianson. Uh, now, the last docket was uh, denied for the special use permit. Uh, yes, it was denied. 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 Yes, Second. Second by McDowell. Can I ask? Yes, you may. Was there a recommendation from the zoning board on this? Yes, I'm sorry. A recommendation is denied vote for it. Consistent with the recommendation uh, set forth on 9A, correct? Yes. Thank you, sir. Right. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Commissioner Carson? Aye. Commissioner Holmes? Aye. Commissioner McDowell? Aye. Commissioner Fisher? No. Jerry King? Aye. Uh, motion carries four to one. Uh, Mr. Peter, you wanted to make some comments? Uh, no, I, I wanted to uh, basically address any issues, additional concerns that arose uh, based on my response to uh, the initial concern. Obviously, we won't bear any other issues. Uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Item number 9C, consider approval of a redevelopment agreement by and between the City of Zion and Great Animal Hospital. Inc. per Administrator Nabel. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, Grace Animal Hospital approached us for a TIF incentive for expansion and construction of the new, uh, new, well, for expansion of their business into a new facility. Um, the TIF board reviewed and, and went through all the application. They recommended approval contingent on financial review by myself. Um, we've been talking with, with Tony Gray, who's here. The, the owners are here for any questions that you may have. Um, based on the items, uh, while it's be a good project for the city, it's a good business. My recommendation, as presented in, to the, in the packet, is that we deny the grant uh, request as presented. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to follow the recommendation of the 
city administrator. I would actually make a motion to follow the recommendation of the recommending body. Is there a second? So that means to, to approve, right? To approve, to yeah. To approve, okay, so you want to approve. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Motion by McDowell. Uh, any no, motion? second by McDowell. Second by McDowell. Yeah. We had a motion by Friars and a second by McDowell. Uh, questions or comments? Can you unpack a little bit your concern? So one of, one of the big challenges on TIF is um, determination of need um, based on financial criteria. And there were financial statement projections that um, were kind of a moving target that, in, in, and I talked with Commissioner Frierson about some of this stuff as well. Um, a lot of my bias on this is probably ingrained in 20 years of public accounting for myself. So the financial aspect related to the information that was presented is skewing me towards uh, the recommendation for the denial and some of the financial information that was presented as part of the, the application process. So some of that will be mitigated by um, the fact that there will be a new building within, within the community with this going through and they wouldn't get the reimbursement without the construction. So that will add to tax base. It will keep a good business here in the city. It's just my financial hat is um, overpowering my, is making me lean a little bit to the one way. Is it the amount or so something the, else? It's, it's partially the amount. Um, the, the TIF is pretty new mm -hmm. um, and we already utilized a million and a half for a rear wheels incentive that basically that TIF owes the city back. So that fund is in a deficit, but it doesn't mean that we can't continue to utilize for development. Um, but there was just, it, it was just some some corporate accounting things with um, some startup costs and loans from shareholder, which isn't abnormal in, in a business, but there was a larger balance on there that just put me a little bit leery from a financial standpoint. Um, we also presented a loan option for the incentive, but the applicant wanted to move forward with the grant, um, which is their right and absolutely um, able to do so. So I don't really have any specific question, but I mean, just from a comment perspective. So as Administrator Nabel uh, mentioned, we chatted a little bit earlier. Um, the level of scrutiny is not something that we've traditionally done on any of the TIF applications. So um, I was looking at this based on the merits of the project itself um, and everything that I can see based on the project. Um, like you said, it is a new building. It's an expansion of uh, an existing business. Um, it opens up for some of the other development that is going into that space. Um, and so, you know, given everything taken into account, the, the benefits outweigh any risk uh, based on uh, anything that was gleaned from looking at financial statements. I think you sent a letter to some of the commissioners, at least I got one. Um, your customer base has increased significantly. I think it was in the yes. thousands, is um, that right? I uh, opened this startup in 2018. Um, with myself as the only doctor and five employees and zero clients. I've been in the community over 25 years at Harvard. Um, so five years ago, I started with nothing new building in front of a startup. And now we have, um, I just hired a third doctor, including myself. Um, and we have 8,000 clients and 18 employees. And um, unlike most, this is during COVID, we had an open, and I don't know if you guys call the news, that our business is considered essential, um, and we grew faster than we could keep up with. And right now, 2,000 square feet is not enough space for us. Uh, we're one of the few clinics for a GP uh, urgent care hybrid clinic that is open seven days a week. And so we serve the Zion community by offering um, you know, part of the high standard of care where if you go to Premier and your dog ate uh, metal prong collar, it's eight grand, and we can do it for a quarter of that cost. Mm -hmm. So I think we would serve the community well, and this is, I think, a win-win for this week. Thanks. Thanks. 
Mr. Chair, I just want to make sure the record is clear. Uh, Ma'am, could you put your name in the record just so Madam Clerk has a clear for her name? Tiny Gray McLaughlin, Tiny Gray. Thank you. Um, could you also speak to your commitment to want to stay in the Zion area? And then also, I believe your application uh, listed a number of jobs that would be created by this expansion. Yes, I actually grew up in Waukegan, both in high school, raised my parents over there, so two of my sons here in Clinton. Um, and we decided to move to Gurney for a better school system. Um, and I decided, you know, after graduating by Urbana, I wanted to practice um, the opportunity to present itself at and with the partner, Dr. Ned Bartlett, as Mr. Fisher knows too, um, I'm in for it. But um, I've grown to love my clients and did not want to move. You know, the record business has grown, I can go anywhere I want, but uh, I am very happy. And I'd like to stay in Zion. So in order to stay in Zion, we would need to have to plan. Otherwise, we would um, have to you know, research other areas. Thank you. Okay. Any additional questions? David, there's a clawback provision in here mm -hmm. um, that's standard with, with any TIF. Um, Correct. If they can put a provision in there that says right. um, that the grant is forgiven over a period of 10 years. So th this came about not because of this project, but that's a standard. projects in general so that somebody doesn't approve their business with city funds, basically flip, flip it, it, make a profit, right. take off. Right. So it gets forgiven. You know, over time, or a proportionate share, um, it, it, it can either be transferred with with council approval to continue on, or the proportionate share is due back at closing. Okay. Any other questions, uh, Madam Clerk? Please call the roll. Commissioner Harrison. Aye. Commissioner Holmes. Aye. Commissioner McDowell. Aye. Commissioner Fisher. Aye. Aye. All right, motion carries, five zip. Thank you. Item number 9D is presentation and or consideration of a transfer of a liquor license for a BMS property group for city attorney. For city attorney, thank you, Mr. Chair. I thought you were telling me I was missing something. No, 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 no. All right. All right. Um, thank you all, Mr. Chair. As you are aware, the City Council has recently amended the City's Liquor Code. These changes call for a more modern mechanism of control, the attrition of certain liquor license, and one that promotes actual city transparency. Um, the long and the short of it is, this is an initial statement to be made by the possible future operators of a restaurant commonly known as Zogos, Baiju Matthew and Sancho Sakaria. I apologize if I messed up your names. Um, I am doing my best here with um, that. And the current owning um, is Bonnie Pappas, who everybody knows. The current operators um, understand that there is a process. They understand that they have to go to the Liquor Control Commission. I did speak to their attorney. But they did want to introduce themselves to the city council, the mayor, and provide a level of confidence to this board that they will see again, that they are responsible operators, have operated other similar facilities responsibly and actually become a familiar face before the city council of the city of Zion. So if the operators who want to come in here want to make a statement at this point in time, we'd invite them to do so. Now is not the time to get stage fright, so you can come right out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
Vidu třeba to tejno, to krý, to nakolik mohlo být tam dožejší nota z tý. And that was that they understand that I did speak to their attorney that they know that there's a process that they need to go through. They just wanted to make an introduction and while we'll all be sad to see Bonnie go, that it will be, um, they just wanted to make an introduction to all of you and understand the process that, um, and they understand the process that they'll have to follow to ensure that there's a transfer of liquor licenses. This is actually coming off the heels of our recent amendments of how we actually regulate liquor licenses. And again, it's a much more modern method that we use. Um, so they will be our test case too, but we'll make sure we get it done for them um, if they make the application and process of the work. All right. Because uh, our goal was to try to uh, buy Barney's cooperation, so we were anticipating that, you know, the different licenses are being given by the you know, by buying the stocks. Uh, you know. But that still needs, there's still a level of, um, why don't you guys stick around after the meeting and I can take you guys through it, um, as long as everybody's okay with that rather than get to the minutia of licensees, corporate shareholders, I'm sure we'd all be really interested about all that. <laughs> or we could just let me talk about that and make sure that they understand it with their lawyer on the phone after this meeting, if that's okay, Mr. Chair. That's okay. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, thank, thank you very much. So we're not taking any action? No action need to be taken at this no point. And they will come back before us, presumably, and then there will be action taken at this point in time. This is an introduction. They wanted to make sure that they knew um, that they were friendly face. Okay. All right, item number 9E is discussion regarding the Lake County Consolidated Emergency Communication Lake County proposal per Chief Burton. Thank you, um, Mayor and Commissioners. This, this may be a tag team effort by uh, Chief 39, but I sent you, several, I sent all of you several weeks ago a IGA that discusses the new Lake County Dispatch Center that will utilized as our current PSAP is, is going to, it's in its twilight right now and, and will be closing and we anticipate that uh, we and, and uh, the City of Zion and many other agencies within Lake County will be utilizing the services of Lake County. I just want to ask, answer any questions that I uh, can or the discussion that any of you all may have to comply with those. Will this, will this new uh, consolidated emergency communication center, will it improve our response time uh, to issues that we're having in Zion? And will there be Zion residents that have that experience as operators? It's going to be a very similar model as what we're currently using in Gurney. We have been at the table from the very precipice of all of this through Gurney, Gurney's been a big part of that. They have really pulled up a, a lot of money to make sure that we have a, a, a seat at the table, um, a voice, and, and that we're being heard on how these things are being done and how the system, the, the process is handled through police dispatching, through fire, uh, EMD dispatching. So yes, I would say that the, the, the process is going to be the, the same, hopefully improved. Um, the consolidation of uh, EMS is being mandated through legislation, um, and that's why we combined with Gurney and a few other departments. Um, are there any other viable options besides this this consolidation with Lake County? We have looked into that. Unfortunately, no. We don't have many other options again, honestly. I know there's some other smaller municipalities that have looked into and and may be able to go to a, a, another center that's already in existence and working. However, our volume, the uh, number of calls that we get, both police and fire service requests, would not be accommodated at other centers. And frankly, we would lose a seat at the table. We, at this point, can still be and would be the founding member of, of this entity. It's going to be a new entity to dissolve our current JETSB, our joint ETSB board, and then we would rejoin the new JETSB and, and continue on operations through that. All right. 
Any additional questions? Yeah, do you have any idea of, I mean, if it's that far in the process, how they plan to staff? Um, and so my concern is the number of staff, the burnout, and then also if they'll be taking on new staff where folks from this area would have an opportunity to apply for those positions. Yes, so it is anticipated that we're, I believe, there's several different models as far as hours of work. The model that I believe we were following was about 121 employees would, would move into the new center. Of that, I anticipate a, a fair number of the current dispatchers that are within the county are going to apply and probably earn those jobs. That said, though, we don't have enough dispatchers to fill the seats that are currently anticipated to fill. So, yes, there will be new, uh, new job opportunities, from what I, my understanding is. Okay. Uh, and then, if I'm understanding right, initially, anyway, this is a cost reduction? So, yes, and let me answer a little bit more on the last question you had. We have, we have a number of dispatchers. The, the burnout that you mentioned, the number of dispatchers that are currently held in the eight different PSAPs within the county, all of them, to my understanding, have been offered retention um, bonus, I guess I think that's the right word. But those PSAPs are offering a pay schedule to those employees to keep them on board and help transition to the city. So uh, the intent is to hire as many of those as, as we can. Now, many of them are taking this as a retirement opportunity. Mm -hmm. they're, they're saying they've been doing this for 32 years and just don't want to do it again and are going to move on in their lives. Now, as far as the cost comparisons, yes, the net, net cost is, is lower. Currently, we pay about a million um, fifty thousand for dispatch services annually. The new cost that we're looking at is about 650000 or both police and fire combined. The variable there is the jet speed funds that we get from the state will, what the offset is that 400,000. We will no longer receive and be a part of the Jet Speed board that's going to reallocate those funds for us that purchases equipment such as our Starcom radios or other large purchases. So yes, there's gonna be a $400,000 net gain in, in revenue, recovered revenue. However, we are going to have to, and we will, as uh, Chief Street now, we'll be diligent about budgeting for these items that we need. So some of that offset will come to the cost because you will have to pay for things that you're currently paying for through the just fund. Got it. Okay. But I would argue, and, and we could pretty easily show that you're not having to support a just center. So some of the core, they call them core consoles, they're very, very pricey. And we won't have to be paying for those things. So our costs of radios, phone lines, are different things to rise in first. Our, car, our cars are MDTs. So that cost, I don't anticipate that will one over that point. And to that end, are there any other technological upgrades that would be on the horizon for this? So this is a state-of-the-art facility. And frankly, we are, if I, I don't remember the numbers, but we're one of a handful of people in the state that are moving to text the 911. And we're doing that through current PSAP now, but they are pushing heavily on making sure that the new center is no less than what we currently have. And they've done a great job with that so far. Okay. Um, has there been any discussion about uh, marketing, training, communication out to the public? Not yet that I'm aware of. No, this is all kind of been okay. working. They have a number of committees that are working to try to make sure these things are working and aligning because in combination of this new center coming in, we're also dealing with a whole new representing system, jail management system, CAD mm -hmm. software. So this is all being integrated to, it's, to be honest, it's kind of chaos at times, where there's a number of things you're seeing all these emails and trying to keep track of everything. Mm -hmm. They're doing the county uh, and their team are doing you know, phenomenal job doing that. Two things I would add to your questions. Number one, um, we're, we're in a very comfortable situation partnering with Gurney right now, but we do know that's going away. Um, Gurney is, they've had dispatchers leave, and they are they are able to fill positions in the interim. Presumably that these positions would transfer over to Lake County during that process. So to your question of it, uh, that maybe, maybe the marketing aspect hasn't been out there yet, but I do know that Gurney is looking to fill positions. 
So if there is any, but anybody from our community that's interested in becoming a telecommunicator, um, I would absolutely urge them to look into the job openings that are in the dispatch, police dispatch centers offering right now. Okay. Um, the second point to the financial question, which I'm certainly not an expert at, um, but one of the benefits of this, uh, despite, again, our comfort of how things are now, but things as they are now just can't continue necessarily after this is all said and done. But the county is um, actually taking on a tremendous amount of these initial starter costs. The tune of $40 million dollars plus the technology piece and the, the new CAD systems that we're all going to um, countywide. Uh, so that would be a, a, a huge benefit that we don't have to home up a huge seed money or anything for this. The county is, is taking that on. So that's that benefit benefit for us. I know there's some other additional financial concerns about uh, cost movings um, for other other municipalities that maybe weren't paying their fair share or the real true cost of dispatch services. We in the city of Zion have been doing that for a number of years that we've been partnering with Gurney. We raised those concerns and the board and the other PSAPs agree and they've they removed those fees that would we, the city of Zion, would be supplementing other municipalities for. So we've, we've gotten some of those numbers down as we've had it. You know, so it's just a furtherance of the buy-in and, and the partnership that we've had with them. They do hear us and they are those things. So are you referring to their calculation for weighted and sworn and EAV? Is it embedded in that, or are we talking something different? No, something different. That is th that uh, metric that you're looking at. There was a there was a five-year plan to smooth the cost to transition some of these other entities and other agencies okay. into the center. Because, say for instance, they would then pay 150,000 for services, but the real cost of services is 250. They're getting sticker shock and saying, "Oh my gosh, we can't do this. We haven't budgeted, and this is far higher than what we anticipated." There was going to be some of that cost, that smoothing, um, buffering for these other agencies, born on the entities that we're getting a reduction because our costs are going from, like I said, a million to 600,000. So that we're, we're softening the blow to those other agencies, but now we, through our discussions, those those fees to us have gone away. So we're paying our true fair, fair, fair costs and we're not supplementing anybody or subsidizing anybody else's costs. It may not have been mentioned before, but like we're, like you said, our costs are going down, not everybody in the county's costs are going down. Some actually are going gotcha. down. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't think that was mentioned before. So. And then, yeah. has there been any discussion about price caps? Um, so I know when we switched over to Gurney, like things started to grow exponentially uh, toward the latter, you know, the latter end of that. So has there been, you know, any discussion about what that looks like over a five, seven year period? So there's no, no price cap discussion, although they have looked at a projected amortized payment schedule out several years. Mm -hmm. Now, they continue, and this is part of the discussion and why it's so important to be part of the founding members, because we get a seat at the table to have a discussion to say, we don't agree with the AD population, whatever metrics that they want to use or try to change, because some of these other entities and municipalities may say, that doesn't work for us anymore. We want to we want to reduce our costs, and, and we can't. At least this way, we would have be able to be part of the discussion and have a vote to say no. The current model is correct. It is working, and so th that is a bit of a way to control the costs for us. Got it. Thank you. Any additional comments, questions, Madam Clerk? Please call the roll. Um, just discussion, right? Just discussion? It's just discussion. All right. No action today. All right. No action today. I will present to the board uh, in two weeks. Then. All right. Thank you. Item number 10 is departmental commentary. Director Ionson. Thank you, Your Honor. I brought this up at the last meeting. We'll be set a date for our annual city cleanup. It will be Saturday, August 3rd, between 8th and noon. And you can drop off both items higher than And it will be at the... All right. Same place that it's been the last uh, five or six years. All right. Director Roberts. Thank you, sir. I received a notice from the Union uh, Pacific Railroad if uh, any of the residents utilize Russell Road going west. Uh, 
uh, it will be closed um, Thursday from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. for work on the tracks. There will be a detour uh, with uh, the Laney or Green Bay Road to get to that area. All right. Uh, Director Roberts, for any of our residents that have shown up about the the sewer flooding issue, uh, is there any comments that we like to make? Uh, oh, I should address it afterwards, but I can do it now. Um, as any backup issues or anything, uh, tree issues that fall on private property or anything, those are directed to the city's insurance company from the homeowner's insurance company. So the homeowner needs, and their insurance company needs to contact the city to file a claim and then the city's insurance company would, would make that decision on any type of claim that would be needed. Uh, we do not get involved in any uh, approval or denial of these claims. We just provide the information that would cause it. The current backup that uh, uh, I missed your name, man, sorry. Yeah. Julia had mentioned, um, we had three days of rain previous on that, uh, over two and a half inches of rain. So we had multiple flooding areas throughout areas within the city that contributed to that. Um, so what happens a lot of times in sanitary, that excess water, um, residents, they don't like to take their sump pumps and pump them into their, their uh, yards. They'll connect them illegally into the sanitary, which over inundates that sanitary. Um, so all the debris in there, uh, unfortunately, at the end of the diner, that's right where it, where it ties into the North Shore line, um, all the debris from the Sheridan Road and that whole area collected down in there. Uh, the water department, as soon as we were notified, we were out there uh, and we spent half a day, we unplugged that and it's draining fine now. But what I can do for the future aspect of that area is we could put it at what we call it as a troubled site, maybe. So what that means is we would respond every three to six months and just do a a preparatory cleaning of that line to make sure since it's on the end of the line it's not catching a lot of the other debris. So hopefully that would stop any future backup issue. But as far as any claims that needs to go through the insurance company. All right. Thank you, Director Roberts. Chief Street. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I have just a couple quick things, and I may tack on a third additional comment on the dispatch situation at the end. Um, first thing, I just, um, I'm just kind of happy to announce that many of you probably heard the emergency sirens go off today, right precisely at 10 a.m. Um, after almost a year of maintenance and programming issues through our, the consoles at the dispatch center, we believe we finally got those worked out, and everything worked as planned right at 10 o'clock this morning without us having to do the backup signal from station one across the, the street over there. So that's good news, and um, we've been working on that for quite a while. And um, knock on wood, hopefully the test or any use of the sirens in the next month uh, also go as planned. Um, the last couple meetings, I've mentioned CPR, car seat type offerings, but I actually um, wanted to bring up CPR one more time, because this week just so happens to be National CPR and AED Week. I brought an AED, because many of you might see something like this hanging in public buildings, or schools, or churches, or workout facilities. Um, again, I would just urge, even if you don't feel like taking a full class with us, or American Heart Association, I would just urge you to familiarize yourself um, with certain aspects of CPR, or using an AED. Um, taking a class is certainly the best way to do that, but um, there, are, there are many online resources to at least start familiarizing yourself with um, basic basic techniques or equipment that really could save somebody's life on a bench. Um, I've put some flyers over in the literature center over there just talking a little bit about lay versus CPR. There's um, uh, things out there such as hands only, so if you, if you don't feel like you can breathe into somebody's mouth, you don't necessarily have to. Even doing hands only CPR, compressions only until we get there, also helps survivability data. Um, so please uh, feel free to familiarize yourself with different aspects of CPR and AED use. Um, or contact, for, contact us for a class. The only other comment I was going to make on the dispatch center is, uh, as Chief Barton mentioned, 
it most likely will be an action item at the next meeting to approve that I, um, GA. I would ask any of you with any questions, feel free to let us know either by email or phone call. The, the framers of the IGA and the, the proposed bylaws um, are very open to questions and they'll help us through any of the concerns or questions that we have, up to and including maybe even coming to the next meeting if we really ask them to. So um, that was a, a large document of info to go through. We get that. Um, it's hard for me to even get through that full document. But um, if you have any questions about any of that, please let us know. And we certainly know where to get the answers. All right. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, Chief Street. Chief Barton. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. <laughs> all right. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Officer Hugo Robles. He organized our first Coffee with a Cop on June 1st. Saturday morning at McDonald's, and thank McDonald's uh, North, I guess, uh, they had a tremendous outpouring of support and help, and really was a good show. I, again, very good event, nice to see everyone that came out, talk with a number of individuals that just want to sit down and have a conversation, and it was great, it was nice. Uh, we'll be doing that again probably in October or so, sometime this year. A mention to the flooding that came about this last week, Please, if you see roads or you're having a lot of water um, over the roadways, please don't drive through it. it. It's going to damage your car, it's going to shut you down, and we're going to be out there trying to block traffic and keep people out of it. But we had a number of vehicles that were stranded because of flooding issues that were then we were going to be towed out. It was very difficult, and there was a lot going on, so we were, we were spread off very thin that day. Uh, remember to clean off your little street drains because I was doing that even uh, in about two feet of water outside the PD because our PD was flooding as well during that time. So please remember to clean those drains out, unobstructed drains can drain a lot faster. And then one last thing is a reminder that solicitors need to have a, a permit through the city and I'll be bringing some items to this board for consideration going forward. But uh, Ray Roberts at the building, or I'm sorry, the Public Works has had issues with fraudulent solicitors coming out that are peddling misinformation and trying to get into people's homes unwarranted. If you have a city employee that comes out that are looking to check the water lines, they will have a uh, city badge and will be driving a city truck. So look out your window, look out the front. If you ever have any questions, please call us. We'll gladly respond to make sure and validate that that is an employee of the city. And All right. Thank you, Chief Barton. Director Conway. Maybe Cheryl. <laughs> he talked too much. I really have no update. At all. Okay. <laughs> Administrator Nagel. <Nate>. Right. <laughs> Three things, but I'll be brief. Um, I know we talked. Super backups did that. But also remember, please do not put grease down your drains and do not flush wipes. Those are the biggest, two biggest causes of clogged drains. They might say they're sanitary safe or flushable, but we constantly have problems whenever there's backups or we have to jet things out. It's more often than not related to kitchen grease that people put in their drains or a clog of wipes that doesn't walk through the system. So that's one thing you can do in addition to cleaning off those grates. Um, two other things that are good news, um, some of you may or may not know, the City of Hope filed for a property tax exemption um, as a nonprofit, which would have been an impact of $5 million of taxes that they're paying, that they were paying in, that they were trying to get exempt from. Um, we went to the county and diligently fought on behalf of uh, protecting that, those funds for the community, for all the taxing bodies. Um, the, County board recommended denial uh, of their application, and then it goes down to the state, the Department of Revenue. We just received notice from the Department of Revenue that they also denied the City of Hope's uh, exempt application. So our efforts were successful in trying to protect that. We're still continuing to work with City of Hope to move forward on ensuring, um, as they pursue other avenues, to make sure that they remain a good partner, a good neighbor for the city. Um, going forward, but we just received notice of that. 
I'd also like to, we're sending a letter, but um, Senator Edley Allen went uh, to bat for us for $800,000 of funding towards uh, our new fire station two, and we just got noticed that that will be awarded. It does have to go to the House side and get approved as part of the budget and everything, but she did give us notice um, that on her uh, earmarks for funding that the city of Zion was $800,000 of that towards uh, fire station two. So. Uh, we're taking chunks off that cost wherever we can, looking for grant funding. Um, we've been planning, setting aside money for that project, anticipated, but every dollar we can get offsetting the cost is good news. So um, 800000 coming our way is additional grants, which is great news. Uh, beyond that, that is all I have. All right. Mm -hmm. Nothing for me, Mayor. Right. Commissioner McDonald? Commissioner Friars? Nothing, Mayor. Commissioner Holmes? Oh, I would just like everyone to uh, please uh, make a note that this is this week is the 80th anniversary of the Normandy invasion. So um, give a thought to uh, everyone who basically saved the world. So just a, just, just a little, take a moment. That's it. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Fisher. Uh, my departmental commentary, if you'll bear with me tonight, will. The kind of it is going to be based on comments directed at myself in the city administration at the last Zion Benton High School Township uh, School Board meeting by one of the board members. And I think the term that we were described as is sneaky, behind the scene, and unprofessional. And I sat there and I while you always try to listen to perspectives and criticisms from people to try to improve yourself, I felt, felt that the comments were definitely unfounded because the people I've worked with here in the last nine years have not been, been nothing but transparent to all of our residents. And the center of this comment was based on money that the city of Zion, not any of the other taxing bodies, was able to go to the state and get $15 million a year for the next 23 years. Now it's 22 years for our community. We lobbied the state on the behalf of our community in the generational problems related to the former nuclear plant on our shores. Eight years ago, 2016, Mayor Hill directed these offers, these efforts toward our federal government as part of the 1982 Nuclear Waste Act, that we're supposed to get $15 million a year for having spent fuel rods on our lakefront, preventing us from not being able to develop. While we continue to stop talk with the federal government about this issue, the city of Zion came up with another plan. ComEd, who placed those nuclear plant there, was going to get a bailout from the state. We went to our state reps, our city administrator wrote a letter, an email to our state rep and our state senator and said, if ComEd is going to get a bailout, the city of Zion needs a bailout. And what our state reps did in Lake County, they went down to the states because of the relationships we built with them, and we're able to find another way to get money for our community. Money that is designed to lower property taxes to lower property taxes. and city government, you don't hear that. It's not at all clear that we can fully mitigate the spent fuel rods buried here, so we focused on other generational burden borne by our citizens and businesses, alleviating the city's onerous and sitting, stifling property taxes. So you ask, what does property taxes look like? And some of you have gotten your tax bill. For the grandmother and seniors caring for children, that means not being able to afford medications, skipping meals in order to pay your property taxes. For the children of struggling homeowners, and some of them go to our schools, 
and I'm all pro-education, it means working extra jobs, taking on another layer of stress, if not dysfunction on top of the modern problems that our world presents. All of which affects how these students perform in school, how they behave in our community. And for our businesses, it means less cash for expansion and job creation. Through the relentless focus and work of the City of Zion leaders and legislators, we won a meaningful battle, a very meaningful battle. When we announced this a couple years ago, the state agreed to send $15 million a year to our community for the next now 22 years as a form of economic mitigation related to the nuclear plant as a form of property tax relief and economic development. My administration has been completely transparent about this process and where we feel that the money should go on the best, for the best benefits for our residents. We've met with every taxing body in Zion on multiple occasions, including the superintendent of Zion Benton High School, Dr. Jesse Rodriguez, and the three interim superintendents of District 6 during regularly scheduled meetings. Every taxing body, with the exception of District 6, agreed that tax abatement was the single best use of money to help the city and its citizens. Again, to be clear, that means doing something that never happens in city government, lowering taxes. We had a signed agreement from the city of Zion, the Zion Park District, the library, the township, and the township assessor's office. That when we got this money, we received this money, we would lower praxis, our taxes, which they're killing us. We got the highest tax rate in the state of Illinois. Mr. Rodriguez attended every one of these meetings and he concurred with each of us on every opportunity that reducing property taxes was the best use of these funds because everyone in our community would benefit. Then at the 11th hour, just before the board meeting, he flipped and based on the comments of one of his school board members and the subsequent <laughs> unanimous vote of his board to not support lowering taxes for our residents, we can't come to any other conclusion that he misrepresented to his school board about what this process was about and his participation agreement on the issues of lowering taxes. Even though he had been at every meeting and continuously agreed to use the money to lower taxes for our $25,000 in businesses, our residents and businesses, and even though the process had been completely transparent, Mr. Rodriguez decided that it was in the best interest of the school districts to shortchange our residents and not commit to lowering taxes for, our, for all of us. In this allocation of funds, he deemed that District 6 not only needed 44% of the property taxes already being paid by residents, but also the additional $6.1 million of funding from the state for the next 22 years and that reducing taxes that are currently strangling our residents and our businesses was too much of a burden for both the school, both di school districts 6 and 126. So in short, he misrepresented his position to the school board and demanded 44% of the $15 million to continue to go to District 6, additionally proposed that 25% of the 20, 15 million continue to go to District 126. That means an additional 9.6 million will go to the school district, <coughs> leaving only 4.5 million for the remaining taxing bodies and leaving the burden of reducing taxes for the 25,000 citizens of Zion solely to the park district, the township, the library, and the township assessor's office. In addition to this, he would be absolving, absolving the school districts of any responsibility for their, for their current financial strain put on our families. Now, I shouldn't be surprised by his mendacity. Is this, this, this is not the first time that he's demonstrated a lack of integrity and transparency. While he touts collaboration and teamwork, 
He was quick to pursue his own agenda contrary to what the Zion Leaders Group that represents our communities had agreed upon. It is further demonstration that you judge a man not by his words, but by his actions. Administrator Nable, you? If I may interject real quick, just because this has been, I've been here 12 years and it's been a 12 year process just to give some more details on the background. As, as you mentioned, this all started trying to go with federal, uh, or federal legislation to try and get funds, we call it the Stranded Act, which was a cooperative effort between all of the taxing bodies. Um, we went a different direction back in 2021 uh, with our state legislators to try and curb the bailout that they were looking at. Um, the intent then, the, the unfortunate part of this now is that the administrations that are here, not only the superintendents, but a lot of the board members, have come on board after these initial discussions and the initiative, uh, the initial battle for this happened. So the discussion was to offset, using the language from the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, to offset the economic and social impact of closure of that nuclear power plant. The direct economic impact of closure was a 145% increase in burden to our tax, to our residents and businesses. That money, 19 million a year that the plant was paying in property taxes, now shifted to everyone else. So the direct impact of that was an increase in taxes. The only thing we could do with these funds was address the economic impact by trying to lower taxes. We wrote them into the legend, we wrote all of the other taxing bodies into the legislation, initially based on a proportionate share of the property tax bill. So when you talk about the 6.1 million um, to the school district, to district six and 3.4 million, almost 3.5 million to district 126, it was never the intent that they get 6 million and 3 million respectively to just operate on. It was to then take that fund, what we proposed was taking 75% of these funds that they were getting every year and reduce taxes by that amount. So it created an influx of new capital, new funds for all of the taxing bodies, but we reduced the burden by, it basically be a $10 million reduction or a 20% reduction to tax burden for our residents and businesses. That was the intent. What's happened is that those funds have basically just gone to um, all the taxing bodies with no offset. What we proposed and was, I believe, not presented, and I'm only going off of what the resolution that was presented at the high school board meeting was. The information that was in there, while accurate, was not complete. Um, if I could read from one of the items, it said the districts, whereas the district's share, District 126 of the grant for 2023 was 3.4 million, which represented 24% of the total funding, the city of Zion's share of the grant was 1.9 million, which represented 14% of the funding. Whereas the city requested that the grant funding be reallocated so that the district's share would be reduced to 15% and the city's share would be increased to 60% of total funding. That's the extent of what was in the resolution, which makes it sound like the city is trying to grab at additional funds for this. What was proposed to each of the taxing bodies below and is not included in this is that with that 60% allocation, our share was 1.9 million, our net share would continue to be 1.9 million. Of that 60% that we're getting, we would abate 75% of that, resulting in $6.4 million abatement to taxes. We presented that to every taxing body, and we got signatures from everyone supporting reallocation, except for District 126 and uh, District 6. District 6 was clear up front that they would not be looking at abatement for, for taxes, which again was not the original intent of the efforts for this. Um, Dr. Rodriguez did say he was initially supported of this, um, said he was going to have to present and talk to his finance committee, and then as, as mentioned, the resolution was in opposition, but I do feel that it was incomplete in telling the true and whole story of what the efforts are related to this. It made it look like the city was going after a cash grab when actually we were trying to not collect any more than everyone was already collecting, but 
get an abatement for taxes as promised, as intended. Um, and that's what was voted um, in opposition, um, and then there were claims made that were just unfounded. Um, sorry, to interrupt. No, that, that, that's okay. I, I think it, it, it speaks to what I was uh, talking about, it, and what bothered me was a sentence, the sentence and the accusation of the city has not been transparent, and we've been transparent with everything we've done. To hide something in a resolution and not include what was admitted, what was included in a conversation, that's deception. That's misrepresentation. That's gutless, that's cowardless, that's not good leadership. So we want to talk about a lack of transparency. Let's talk about some of the safety issues at, at the school. You might recall the shooting that took place after a basketball game. Waukegan High School played Zion. They've had a contentious relationship for years. Our police chief has asked the school system repeatedly when there's a sporting event at our school, you have to let us know in advance so that we can assign the personnel to be there. You can't call us the last day and say, hey, we've got a game. Can your officers show up? We've, got a, we've, had, we've been understaffed for years. In this shooting that took place, there were bullets shot at people coming out of the game. Our residents and visitors, and that paints a bad picture of us. You want to talk about lack of transparency? When the police offered, ask for the tape of the shooting, it was delayed because they, it prevented further investigation of being able to capture these people who created this heinous crime in our city. We've asked the school you know, police chief, expert on safety, why don't you put more parking uh, cameras or lights in your parking lot? It's, it's too dim. Why don't you put the flock cameras at the entrance of your school? So now if something happens, our flock cameras, the license plates readers, we can get these people. It's helped us solve all kind of crimes. And you want to talk about lack of transparency. There were a couple of bomb threats called into the school. Superintendent did not call the police department promptly. He wanted to handle it on his own. Everything's fine at the high school. Well, that's not the truth. Another group of students set off firecrackers in the bedroom, in the bathroom, excuse me. I'm a little passionate about this, excuse me. This burns me up. Set off firecrackers in the bathroom. Yelled shot fired, and that triggered responses from multi agencies all across the U all across Lake County. And we were told by a charge of the designee of the superintendent not to show up. But yet we take all of the heat when we were trying to keep our residents and our students safe. We got burned at the stake at a community meeting for our lack of inaction. These are the experts. Not a security director at the school that's given a security certificate. Our jobs in this city, and we've talked about this from the day I took over, was safety in this community, protecting our students and our residents. And you've got lack of transparency at the school about safety issues. I always say this, if you're going to criticize, look at my backyard for issues, Take a look at yours before you start criticizing. Any issues that we've had in this city, I'll take responsibility for when we make a mistake. I've never shied away from that. When people have called me about a mistake we've made, I've owned it. So tell your superintendent to do the same thing. In the context of American school shootings in the 21st century, Nothing is more important to our police department than keeping our students and our citizens safe. And yet, not only does Mr. Rodriguez seem more aligned with his own self-interest, but he continues to fight the city on other safety missile, safety issues, especially flock cameras and lighting that would be added bonuses in the school parking lot. 
I'll say this, District 6 is not an empire of one. We've worked incredibly hard over the last seven years to bring everybody out of their silos because our city cannot operate with each taxing body operating in a silo. We created that vision. That man right there, David Nabel, who has been here 13 years, we've been very transparent with everything that we've done within the city. And we've tried to bring people together, share best, best practices, but you can't talk about teamwork and collaboration. You can't talk about it if you don't walk the walk. I respect education. I graduated, I'm a product of Zion Benton High School. So is our police chief, so is our fire chief, so is our city administrator. We're proud of being ZBs, but we're trying to elevate our city as a whole, our community. And when you're sitting on a board, you can't have a myopic view of what's just best for 2,500 students. It involves 25,000 residents that what you're doing to increase taxes is affecting all of us. If we were an affluent community with mountains of tax revenue, that would be fine. But we're not, not yet. We're working on it. And if people like Mr. Rodriguez continue to manip manipulate false narrative to his own board by controlling information to his own end to effectively dismiss, dismiss the citizenry of this city, we'll never be more than what we are now. I can tell you this, the people sitting up here and working in the city, we're not going to let that happen. You talk about standing against education. I believe in education. Our District 6 has been one of the poorest performing districts in the state, on the verge of being taken back by the state. And I look at the nice buildings that are being built at Benton High School. It's great. You got a performing arts center, you got an aquatic center, 12 million, 9 million, the new football field. New offices for the staff and administration, and we're paying for it. Racism, the, the comment was brought that the city, by not giving the schools this money, and they're going to get $2 million out of it anyway, money that we brought to the table. You talk about we're continuing the racism pattern of 400 years of racism in this country, you just fired a very competent black man as a superintendent, and you want to talk to me about racism. Zach Livington was a principal there at the school. Everyone loved him, and he was forced out because he wasn't a sickle fan. And everyone that has left there has talked about those same things, and you want to talk about transparency. I'm sorry to get so passionate about this, but this is our community. It's not about the city of Zion, I've said this. The school is not the city. The park district is not the city. It takes all of these institutions, these taxing bodies, to be able to make this city function. If we're not paving roads, creating safety, we don't have much of a school system. We are not sneaky. We are not behind the door making deals. We've been very transparent with everyone in that taxing body that how do you get five taxing bodies to sign an agreement? That's not sneaky, that's pretty open. In any event, uh, that's all I have to say about that uh, this evening. Uh, excuse me for my passions getting out of hand because when you talk about the city, I've lived here, my family's lived here since 1962. And we have people that come into this community that are here for short time. The superintendents that come in, they want to build buildings and then they're on to their next job and they're leaving us with the crushing debt that we have to face. They don't live in the community. They don't show up at community events but they want to talk about what we're doing for, it's more than about the kids. You've got 25,000 other people here that are important that figure into this equation. 
Item number 11 is announcements on June 15, from 8 to 6 p.m. We have our 36th annual Nostalgia Days Festival. Please show up. It's one of the best events in Lake County. June 18th at 6 o'clock, we have a Zion Township Board meeting. And at June 18th, we have at 7 o'clock, it's followed by the Zion City Council meeting. July 2nd, we're getting close to the 4th of July. Can't believe we're in June already. We have a Zion City Council meeting as Director Einstein talked about on August 3rd, we have our sixth annual cleanup day. Item number 12, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> Second. Thank you for coming out and everybody have a good evening.